Isaiah 35. It talks about a way that we can travel, a journey that we can take. And Isaiah 35, the way of holiness, it says, The wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it. The excellency of Carmel and Sharon, they shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. Strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are of fearful heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with a recompense. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart and the tongue of the dumb sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out and streams in the desert. And the parched ground shall become a pool and the thirsty land springs of water. In the habitation of dragons where it's lay shall be grass with reeds and rushes, and a highway shall be there, and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those, the wayfaring men, though fools shall not err therein. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go up thereon, it shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there, and the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing, with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Mm. Praise the Lord. The way of holiness. Our text tells us of this way, this way to live, this way to walk this way to be. And there's some themes here that we can take heart in through this chapter. Some themes that stood out to me as signposts, if you like, on this journey, on this way, on this travelling that we make in life called the way of holiness. And it's evidenced by the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. And we can join the travellers on this journey, along this highway. We can join their company But it's a select company. It's a select company. You know, we sing a song in our book, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. And of course, when we say, when we use the word all, we're talking about the saved. The all will get to heaven. And we will be rejoicing again in glory. We that love the Lord that are saved, but it's not a given that everyone will be there. Only those who are saved can be a part of this company because it's the company of the redeemed, the redeemed or the ransomed. We see both words in, the, in this chapter. The company is the company of the ransomed, the company of the redeemed. What does that mean? Redeemed, it means we've been bought with a price. It means that we were, as the picture is, of slaves in a slave market, enslaved by sin, in bondage, in captivity, and we were released, redeemed, spared by God's grace. He bid his blood for us. He paid the ultimate price for us. The wages of sin is death, and he paid those wages for us by dying in our stead on Calvary's hill, taking your sin, taking my sin there, and paying for it in full. But we must be redeemed. We must cry out for him to save us, for him to be our saviour. And the company of the saved is the company talked about here on this journey. The company that preaches, that teaches, that lives, that stands by the word of God, the Bible, that believes it and makes it live in their lives. <clears throat> and has salvation by his grace and mercy and his favour. And we need some water on that, on that journey, amen? <laughs> we need some streams of living water, but we'll get to those. 
Someone this morning was saying to me, you need to jump in the river. And I know what she meant by that. It's a popular, popular statement that some people use. Mm -hmm. but, but the Bible says not to jump in the river, but the river. It's the streams of living water flow out of us. Mm -hmm. We don't jump in the river. The river's in us. The river is flowing out of us. The, the streams of living water, yeah. of the living water of, of God's Spirit. And uh, we know some use this phrase, jump in the river, but it's really not, not in here, in the Bible. It's the way of holiness. The way of holiness. Who is on this way? Those who name the name of Christ. It tells us in 2 Timothy 2.19, they will depart from iniquity. Now, one of my favourite books, really, beside the Bible, I would say, is my most favourite book beside the Bible, you could say, and people have heard this before, Pilgrim's Progress. It's jam-packed with Bible verses, with Bible truth, and with pictures. I love pictures, you know. I, I should have been an artist, but... but uh, the pictures that are painted in this book, the beautiful pictures of fleeing the, the city of destruction, fleeing that city and, and traversing that journey to the heavenly, heavenly city. And uh, friends, as much you could, I'd encourage you to take a read of that book uh, and just feed on the, the scriptural truth in that book. And it's a picture of this way of holiness, you could say. They depart from iniquity and they find Christ. They turn to Christ. They turn from sin to the Saviour. And that's what Pilgrim did in Pilgrim's Progress. And he was ready to meet his God. As the Bible says, prepare to meet thy God. The, the pilgrims, the travellers on this journey, they're ready to meet their Maker, to meet their Saviour. And some of the things that strike me on this journey, I put as three themes that strike me, the features of these travellers and of this highway. And we'd like others to join us too. When I say it's a select company, it doesn't mean, well, we're in and you're out and we, uh, you know, we, we don't care about those that aren't on this journey. We want to welcome and, and beckon and invite and constrain others to come, to come and join us on this journey. We're not wanting to keep it to ourselves. We're wanting to communicate the gospel to anyone who's got ears to hear that they might trust him. You know, it's not that we're wanting to be a select company in that we don't care about the lost. Certainly not. We must care for the lost. We must reach out to anyone that we can reach out to. And our desire is to see the lost ones join us, to turn to the Saviour, to join us on this way. And it's interesting right through the Word that we are the way. The Christians are, in Acts, they're called the people of the way. Mm -hmm. We found the way. The way, the truth, and the life. And it's, it's the greatest way. The, the only way. The one way, Jesus Christ. And one of these themes is strength in weakness. One of the themes that stood out to me of the people on this journey are that they have strength in weakness. Strength in weakness. We see that, for example, in verse 3, it tells us of weak hands, of feeble knees. And verse 4, of the fearful in heart. I know someone with, with, the, with the feeble knees, but <laughs> thank God that whatever your condition, mm. if you've got weak hands, if you've got feeble knees, if you've got a feeble mind, mm -hmm. if you're fearful in heart, whatever your state, whatever your standing, there's a place for you on this highway if you'll but heed him. Because the strength in weakness. And it's when we are weak that he becomes strong. Amen. It's when we realise how sinful and utterly undeserving we are of his way that we can start to even open our hearts to receive it. And it says strengthen the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. And Christianity is for the weak. It's for the weak. It's for the, the sinful. It's for the unworthy. As Christ says, it didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Mm. Who was it who heard him? Who was it who came to him? The prostitutes, the, the vile, the, the wicked, the, the corrupt, the tax collectors. And who were those who rejected him? Who were those who did not hear him? Who were those who blocked their ears? The righteous, those who had it all together as the world would count it but the strength in weakness, the strength for the weak. And I thank God. You know, I was blessed by, by some lovely people uh, thinking of us this week, uh, different cars that were sent. And it's sometimes those that, 
people might discount. And, and yet I was blessed by those, those lovely saints that might not be thought much of by others that bless my soul, it's the weak, it's the feeble, it's the inadequate that God uses and blesses and fills with himself. And the faith is for the weak. It's when we realise our inadequacy, when we realise our sinfulness, when we realise the deceitfulness of sin, that we cry out in our agony, in our pit, in our slime of mud, of, of that miry clay of sin and we cry out and reach out and realise his strength and the message is strong the gospel is strong, it's powerful as Paul said, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek it is the power of God I'm not ashamed of it the power of God in our weakness we can receive that powerful word from God. And the Christian life is both a resisting force and a yielding force, as we talked about lately. Will we conform to his will or conform to this world? The choices are, are distinct and opposite. And our burning desire is to be like him, not like the world, not like the enemy's toys and trinkets that would dazzle and distract and steer us away from him but our burning desire is to come to him to be like him and there's much encouraging verses in this chapter it talks about fear not he will come and save you if you're fearful if you're weak if you're feeble he can come and save you and thank God there is strength in weakness when we come to the end of ourselves, He is there. When we come in hunger, in inadequacy, in emptiness, He can fill us. He can take us beyond ourselves. And faith can be that mighty, dynamic impact on our hearts as we let God have His way, as, he let, as we let God energise us with His divine energy and empower us. And God's people through history, these were the weak. They were the weak, they were the inadequate, they were the scorned and the mocked, as the world would reckon it. The way of holiness, it needs strength in weakness. I was reading of late of some old time gospel preachers, and I wondered, would we be in their number if we were transported back in time to the 1700s, when the old gospel preachers would stand out in the marketplaces and in the fields and in the streets, in the lanes, in the city places, the churches wouldn't have them. They were non-conformists. They were not authorised. They were not credentialed. They were not uh, part of the establishment of the time, of the day. And they had to set their faces like flint. As we read, for example, a man called John Furs in the 1700s. Listen to this and put yourself in their number. As soon as I began to preach, a man came straight forward and presented a gun at my face, swearing that he would blow my brains out if I spake another word. However, I continued speaking. And he continued swearing, sometimes putting the muzzle to my mouth, sometimes the gun against my ear. While we were singing the last hymn, he got behind me, fired the gun, and burnt off part of my hair. Strength in weakness. God uses the weak. God uses the inadequate. God uses the frail. If you're feeling inadequate, that's the place to start. The place where he can start with you. There is strength in weakness. Another account of another contemporary of John Wesley, a man called John Nelson, he coolly described the open air work. Rundlemore's nothing compared to this. John Nelson, another contemporary of John Wesley, says, but when I was in the middle of my discourse, one at the outside of the congregation threw a stone which cut me on the head. However, that made the people give greater attention, especially when they saw the blood running down my face. So all was quiet till I had done. 
and was singing a hymn. He was almost glad because it made the people pay attention. You know, I don't know what we have to do to get people to pay attention to the Word of God. But, you know, what a blessing. There is strength in weakness. These were those that were scorned and mocked and derided in their day. Strength can come in your weakness, brother. Strength can come in your weakness, sister, if you'll just yield to his holy empowerment. Yield to that intense power of the power of God's Spirit, the power of His Word, the life-changing message of the Gospel can give us boldness in all of our inadequacy and make us stand. By the way, the 17th of December, there's street witnessing in Mungamore at 7 o'clock. Mm -hmm. If you're free, why, not, why don't you go? Amen. Why don't you go even just to be part of the crowd? Be one of the hecklers. It helps draw <laughs> others to come. You know, be a part of it. Be a part of it. Brother, sister, be encouraged. We need to be about the open public testimony of the gospel. And we know there's different ones there with different views and ideas. Not all of them we'd stand shoulder to shoulder with. But their message, the message of the gospel, mm. is one that needs to be declared. And thank God it still can be in the city of churches, so-called, of Adelaide. A second theme on this highway is streams in the desert. Streams in the desert. We see this right through Isaiah 35, some of the features of this desert. It says, in the wilderness, water shall break out. This highway of holiness is one that is in the desert place. But the streams come there. The water comes there. The wilderness, the solitary place, the parched, the thirsty, the waters come. And of course we know, as, as much as there's different uh, analogies, the Spirit of God is spoken of as being a streams of living water coming out of our belly, as it were. And also the Word of God can be described as a washing of water by the Word. And so think of these streams that we could see pictured here. The Word of God, the Spirit of God, the streams in the desert. And think of it, brother, sister, the immeasurable power of the Holy Spirit, the immeasurable power of the Spirit that brooded on the face of the waters and life was created. The power of the Spirit of God that empowered the men and women of God through the pages of Scripture, that same power, that same Spirit that raised up Christ from the dead in that resurrection glory, that same Spirit can dwell within you. Mm -hmm. The immeasurable power of the Holy Spirit of God. And what happens when the Spirit comes? What happens when the Word comes? That desert place, that solitary place, that wilderness place, it says it shall become a pool. It shall blossom abundantly. It shall be springs of water. It shall yield grass with reeds and rushes. Even in this desolate world, even in this dry and dusty and dead old nation of Australia, this rotten and godless society that we live in, the living streams can come. Mm. The living streams can come. The glory, the excellency of God can come and visit us. And we can believe God for a revival in our own heart, even if it be just in your heart. Mm. It's revival, isn't it? When the Spirit of God truly does His work, when the people of God truly quake, at His Word, at His presence, and search their hearts and confess their sins and get excited about evangelising the world. We need that kind of revival. Mm -hmm. It's not about jumping in a river and having a hullabaloo and a razzmatazz. It's about the Spirit of the living God. Mm -hmm. It's about the Word of God breaking up men's hearts as the fallow ground is broken up, as hearts are repenting in true faith and God truly moves that kind of revival. That's what we're talking about. A truly heaven-sent revival. Not a man-worked-up revival. A heaven-sent revival. A revival that comes by prayer. A revival that comes by seeking His face. As someone wrote to me lately, if we meet the conditions, we shall have it. Mm. If we meet the conditions of God's Word. Brother Forbes wrote to me, if we meet the conditions, we shall have it. Revival. But it's got to be God's conditions, doesn't it? 
It's got to be God's conditions, not our own way of thinking, not our own methodology. And that's what someone was telling me earlier. In fact, two people were telling me before the service started, not the business side of the marketing kind of Christianity that's a man-made machine, but the Spirit of God truly at work, truly moving, truly ministering. And that Spirit of God can jumpstart us out of our deadness, out of our shallowness, out of our coldness. Even those dry bones in the valley can bring, he can bring back to life again. He can jumpstart the church of God again. Not by some shallow methodology or ma manufactured method of men, but the word of God and the spirit of God as we return to it. Because the book will do the job. The book. That's what we need. I know a brother was sharing this morning. We need to be a people of one book. This is the book that will do the job, not some church growth kind of book, as much as there might be elements of truth in even such things, but the book shall do the job. Not by man's methodology, but God's methodology. And what was that? Elijah, he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. What did he do? He went back to the altar. That altar that had broken down, that altar that was covered in dust and ruin and Forgotten, forsaken, covered in cobwebs perhaps, you could imagine. The altar that was broken down, he went about repairing the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And then God moved. God moved. Restoration can happen. It says I touched on this morning, revivals in the word of God. Five occasions it was man seeking God and returning to obedience to the word of God. That's when he can move. God wants to move in your heart. He wants to move in my heart, in our lives, to restore and break through that lack of concern, that apathy, that carelessness that callouses us, doesn't it? When you think about it, brother and sister, in the Western world, what is there for us to be worried about in terms of persecution? Even if we go preaching in Rundle Mall, what's the worst they can do to us? Brothers and sisters, we've got nothing to really stop us. We should be unstoppable. Mm -hmm. We should be all out. Pull out all the stops and stop our apathy. Stop our lack of concern. Stop those things that are hindering us. Those things that are obstructing us from doing what God has commanded us to do. And streams in the desert can happen again. Ye are the temple of the living God, it says. 2 Corinthians 6, 16. Get a hold of that. What does that mean? You are a container that the Holy Spirit resides in. He dwells in it. It's his dwelling place. Not in temples made by hands of man, but the Spirit of God dwells in those vessels of clay, in that vessel that is your body. He resides in it, the streams in the desert. But we need to stir up ourselves, friends. God wants us to. In Isaiah 64, 7, it says... The prophet cried, There is none that calleth upon thy name. There is none that calleth upon thy name that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee. For thou hast hid thy face from us and hast consumed us because of our iniquities. Isaiah 64 verse 7. There is none that stirreth up himself. God forbid that that would be true for you, for me, for us, for this church, for our churches that there is none that stirreth up himself to take hold of God. The water speaks to us of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Bible, the washing of water by the Word. It's by the Word that the young man can cleanse his way. Psalm 119 verse 9. We know the world will pollute us. The, the polluting streams are all around us, but the living water, the streams in the desert, you know, it's better than pure tap. It's better than, than, the, than the SA water can give you. This water is crystal clear and perfect. It's better than reverse osmosis. This is water from the living water, of the streams of living water. You know, I'm being somewhat flippant here, but nothing can be purer than this water. And what can a young man defile his, uh, cleanse his way with? By the washing of the water, by taking him to the Word of God. And it must get into the heart and into the soul to invade every area of our life. And streams can come in the desert. If you're feeling dry, if you're feeling desolate, if you're feeling like there's a famine in the land, get the Word. 
Get the Spirit. Stir up. Strength in weakness, strength in the desert. Thirdly, another thing that stands out is singing in sorrow. Singing in sorrow. We see the singing here. The lame shall walk, the tongue of the dumb shall sing. The ears unstopped, the eyes opened. Singing in sorrow. Those who are singing are those who are... who had been in the desert place. The ones who are singing are those who are fearful. The ones who are singing are those who are in that parched place. The ones who are singing know there's no lion there, no ravenous beast there. The ones who are singing are redeemed. The ones who are singing are ransomed. The travellers on this highway, no wonder they've got reason to sing. If you're saved, you've got a song. Amen? Amen. If you're saved, he's got a melody in your heart, making melody in your heart to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. No wonder there is singing on this highway of holiness because the redeemed are there, the ransomed are there. Why? Because they have everlasting joy on their heads. Sorrow and sighing shall flee away. We've all had times of sorrow and sighing. Perhaps some, even here and now, you've got sorrow and sighing. Things aren't as, as much as you'd like them to be, for whatever reason. But there can be singing in your sorrow. There can be singing in the darkness. There can be singing at midnight. There can be singing because there's a song in your heart. And we see in these travels the triumph, the victory of God's people in an evil age. Sighing and sorrow shall flee away. The parched ground shall become a pool, the desolate shall be made fruitful, and for the believer, though there be sighs and sorrows for a season, there is a singing. Sighs and sorrows, perhaps scars too. Perhaps scars. You might have some scars. Wounds, hurts, we all have. Sad things happen to God's people too. Of hurts, wounded hearts. Mr. Valiant for Truth, one of the uh, characters in Pilgrim's Progress, he got to the river, uh, he, he jumped in the river <laughs> to get to the other side, you know, to get to, to cross that final river, the river, as it were, of death, of passing from life, uh, earthly life into, into the beyond, as he crossed that river, that threshold, into glory. And he says as he crossed that river, I carry my scars with me as a testimony to my Lord that I loved him. You know, as a Christian, we sometimes have scars. We can have scars, wounds, hurts, but even those scars can be for his glory. Mm. Amen. Even those hurting times, even those sad occasions and times that might still make us shed a tear as we look back and think of how it hurt, but even those scars. We can have joy. We can have singing in our sorrow, singing despite our sighing, despite our scars. Sometimes it may be the Lord allowing such things as chastising, as he helps his wandering children to draw closer to him, to turn from our coldness and our worldliness, to return to the book, to be doers of it, and busy with the Father's will and work. And friends, be urged today, I pray, we all can be urged to read our Bible more faithfully and think as we think of that sighing and sorrow that shall flee away think of the Lord's sorrow for you the sorrow over your sin as he looked at the city and he wept over it as he cast his eyes over the city his heart was broken the heartbreaking agony as he saw the Christless ones as he saw the agony of the sin of the rejection of the lostness Yet for us, the joy that we can know can be full. We can know that joy, and that joy can be full. Now friends, just to close, the way of holiness, it's a way. It's a walk, it's a journey, it's a life. And the Lord commands us to this way, to this way, the way of holiness. As I say, it's not a way that is dowdy and miserable and uh, self-condemning. It's the beauty of holiness. It's a glorious place. It's an excellent place. It's a joyful place. There is 
a wonderful joy in that delighting to do thy will. As David said in Psalm 14, I delight to do thy will, O my God. And as Christ himself said, my meat, my food, that which I feed upon, my meat, he says, is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. And as we're told that we are created for his pleasure. We are created for his pleasure. There's a purpose for your life and it's to give him pleasure. It's for him to be enjoying your life unto him. Mm. And friends, are you prepared to meet him? Have you even started to walk this way yet? It's the way that starts when you're redeemed. When you're redeemed. When there's a purchase made. When there's a price paid. When you receive his work for you. When you trust him. When you say, I surrender. When you say, I'm inadequate, I'm weak. His strength comes. His life comes. When you say, I'm parched and dead and desolate. Those streams of living water come. And friends, that singing can come, the joy of knowing him. Are you amongst the redeemed? Are you amongst the ransomed? Are you amongst the rejoicing? You can be tonight, not by any virtue of your own. As you come simply in trust, in faith, in your weakness to trust his strength, in your sinfulness to trust his grace, in your sighing and sorrow to receive his joy. Let us pray. Amen.